Hey, join with me in, uh, as I read Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 14. On reasons to rejoice, we're going to talk about content always. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Now at last you revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. Uh, you along with humble means, I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. Oh, we thank you for this word today. Thank you for the idea that we can be content with your blessings. May we take this to heart today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We straighten this out a little bit. Now, I'm not satisfied with that, but that's the way it is. That's what we're going to talk about today. Are we satisfied with things in life? Are we satisfied with who we are, who we live for, and all of that? I mean, contentment is hard. It's, it's extremely difficult. Uh, several reasons for that. One reason is we always want more. We want to have more. We want to win more. We want to experience more. Never satisfied with just what we have and what we do. We want more, more, more. Another reason we want to be in the latest style. Now, to be honest, there are some styles that need to stay in the past. Plaid pants, platform shoes, and styled hair need to stay in the 70s. But many times, uh, simply a matter of what we have is not good enough because we want what is in style. What is in style. One other reason, we tend to think in our culture that we have a right to have what everyone else has. I mean, you hear or use the word fair a lot. In other words, if they have it, it's only fair that I have it too. I won't be satisfied until I do. Now, all these reasons fly right in the face of following Jesus because we are to be satisfied with what he's given us and provided for us, but often we're not. We need trust that he knows what we need and we'll be faithful to provide it, but that takes a lot of trust, a lot of faith that not many of us are willing to have to try to make it happen ourselves. It's also, uh, we, we need to see what he's provided as a blessing, be grateful for it. And we've all struggled with being content at one time or another. We all struggle being content at one time or another. None of this is so perfect that we're completely satisfied with who we are, what we have, and what we do all the time. I gotta say, it's not wrong to have more. There's nothing about Christianity or Scripture that says it's wrong to have more. But it is wrong for to let the desire to have more have you. It's wrong to be ungrateful. We have so many blessings of God, so many reasons to rejoice, and yet so often we're very ungrateful. We don't, we don't think to give thanks. We refuse to give thanks. We complain more many times than we give in grateful thanks. Also, that we're driven to get, get, get. It says, sir, sir, sir. Now, we need to be aware of discontent. Discontent is dangerous. Discontent produces a misunderstanding of happiness and joy. Think of what you had. Think if you had what you want, life would be great. And if I just had that, it wouldn't be, would it? It's a mistaken judgment of values also. There's one more thing I want and I'll be happy. It's never been true and never will be true. You always get that one more thing, guess what? There's going to be one more thing you need. You get that one thing, and then there's another thing you need. You never quite have enough to be happy. And then there's misplaced priorities and wrong decisions. I had a couple in our church in Fort Worth, my pastor there. Seminary couple. We got behind in their rent. They didn't have enough food to put on the table, so we got some money together as a church. We paid up the rent, and we uh, bought them groceries and all that. And then we had a church fellowship, and outside the next week ice cream fellowship they showed up with a puppy and they paid a hundred dollars for that puppy now i don't know i want to spend a hundred dollars on a dog but for those who can it's fine if they do nothing wrong with having a puppy 
there's wrong people of God who put forth their resources to help you. And then what you could have used to apply towards rent, to apply towards grocery, you put onto a puppy. Just that's what that's what discontent does. It just leads to misplaced priorities. You need to be aware of discontent because it will lead to several harmful things spiritually. It will lead to depression. What you don't have overwhelms you. It's all you can think about. All you can think about is what I don't have. What I want to have, what I don't have, what I want to have. This occupies your mind all the time. Also leads to envy. Then if you had what others had, you would be happy. If you had what others had, you would be happy. Bet you wouldn't be. It's not designed for you to have those things. And it leads even to things like divorce. I know it's strange but true, but if you're discontent with other areas of your life, pretty soon you'll be discontent with who you're married to in your marriage. See, discontent grows. It doesn't just sit there. One thing leads to another. One thing leads to another. And it's a deep hole that's hard to get out of. It takes every ounce of energy to get out of it. One of God's faithful missionaries, Alan Gardner, experienced many physical difficulties and hardships throughout his service to the Savior. Despite his troubles, he said, Well, God gives me strength. Failure will not daunt me. So in 1851, at the age of 57, he died of disease and starvation while serving on Picton Island uh, at the southern tip of South America. When his body was found, his diary was right next to his body and it bore a record of hunger, thirst, wounds, and loneliness. But the last entry of his, his little book showed the struggle with shaking as he tried to write legibly. It said, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Can you imagine that? being overwhelmed, not having enough to eat, being sick, being lonely, being hungry, all of those things, and yet he said, I'm overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Contentment is being satisfied with God and his blessings, his goodness. It is a learned experience. Paul says, I've learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. Learn to be content, whatever so. How do you learn to be content? Well, first of all, you want to see life like God does. Holiness evangelist Bud Robinson was invited to speak in New York, and, and when he got there, the people, he said, we gave him a tour of the city. And now he got down beside his bed, knelt beside his bed, and prayed, Lord, I thank you that I didn't see anything today I want. How often do you see things of the world and then you kneel before God and say, thank you, Lord, that I didn't see anything I want? Or do you want it? In other ways, in other ways to learn to be content is see each experience, each experience is a blessing from God. Good or bad. It helps us see life this way and we realize we are incapable of determining if a situation is good or bad. An old story, an old parable of an old farmer who lived in a small village. He was poor and he needed money. He had a white horse that people had offered to pay him hundreds of dollars for that horse. The villagers said, you're foolish, old man. You could sell that horse and then you would have enough money for everything you need. Well, he didn't sell his horse. And one day his horse ran away. His neighbor said, oh, we're so sorry. Your horse ran away. You, now you don't have anything to make money on. We're sorry, it's such a bad thing. The man says, I don't know if it's good or bad. We'll see. A few days later, the horse returned, brought 14 wild horses with him. The villager said, oh, this is a great thing, old man. Now you can really take care of your bills. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Old man said, I, we'll see. I don't know if it's good or bad. And then, uh, while well, his son, his only son was, Helping him break the horses. One of the horses threw him and broke his leg. Laid him up. And the villagers came, sorry, old man, that the horse hurt your son. The man said, we'll see. I don't know if it's good or bad. We'll see. Well, the country went to war, and, and when they did, they brought all the young men to be drafted to fight. It was terrible and killed every young man in the village. But the farmer's son was spared. Since his legs were bro <coughs> broken, it prevented him from being drafted. Neighbor said, oh, you must be happy. You must be so happy. 
Man, there's such good news, man. So we'll see. I did not know it was good or bad. See, we're not able to determine in our situation if it's good or bad. You may be without something you think you have to have. You may think it's bad that you don't have it. That may be the best thing happened to you. You're just not capable of making that judgment. You may get something that you thought would really make you happy. It doesn't because you were not capable of making that judgment. Some things we call bad are really God's protection and blessing. Some things we talk call good are things that draw us away from Him and limit His blessings in our lives. We have to learn the promise of Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that God calls us all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Another way we learn to be content is to give thanks in all situations. First Thessalonians 5, 18 says, This is God's command. Everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God never gives us a command to harm us. His commands are always far good. They are the best things for us. See, life is like a book with several chapters. It's constantly changing. Paul been through it all. He'd been through humble means. He'd been through prosperity. He'd been filled. He'd been hungry. He'd been abundance. He'd suffer in need. But like Paul, we can face anything with courage, peace, and joy. Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. This truth is hard because hard for us because life is hard for us. And life being hard for us reveals how anemic we are. We cannot do all things through our strength. We tend to confuse our strength and our strength with his strength. We tend to see what we cannot be done so what we can do. We panic instead of pursuing Jesus and his help. That's not all bad because it drives us to Jesus. What can he not do? What can he not do? The one who, who through whom all things were created and all, created holds all things in this universe together by his word of power. The one who gave sight to the blind, made the lame to walk, and uh, raised the dead. One who has slayed nations with a sword of his mouth and ruled nations with a rod of iron. Can he not take you through any situation or any experience? Can he not take, strong enough to take you through anything you will face? Paul had learned the secret, reliance on Christ and his strength. Paul was not a superman, he was not an extraordinary moral, mortal, but a man who had boundless confidence in the ability of Christ available to him in every situation. J. Vernon McGee said he will give you enablement to do all things in the context of his will for you. This brings us back to Matthew 6.33. Jesus told us all things that we're not to worry about. He said, but, but do this, do this. Make me the priority of your life. I'll take care of everything else. Now we're to seek ye first, the kingdom of God. All of these things shall be added unto you. Paraphrase, make me the priority of your life. I'll take care of everything else. He will take care of everything else. I don't have to want anything, I don't have to need anything, he'll take care of it. A part of the strength comes through his people. Paul mentioned two things they provide in our need. One is they revived their concern, they cared. And when they had opportunity, they did what they could to help. And they shared in his affliction. We do not know what his affliction was, we're not told what they did. But apparently it was helpful. Talking about, about caring, but it only becomes genuine when it leads to action. It's a good thing to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, you love them, you care for them, you will pray for them. But put hands to you, hands, your feet, your back to those words. Get involved in their affliction. With Christ Jesus and with one another, we can face life and all of its issues. Oh, life has its issues. There's always something there to drain us of our joy, to drain us of our confidence in God, to create discontent, to create where we think we have to have more and we want more. Let's, let's not do that. Let's, let's trust Him. Let's trust Him. Let's trust Him. I hope you will. And I hope you will find that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen.